Hello and welcome aboard. For those who I have not had the chance to meet yet, my name is Richard Nonyard and I'm the Chief Strategy Director at Bakke Graduate University. And I'm very happy that you've decided to participate in this webinar. I'm looking forward to my guest, Don Hilliard, a nonprofit executive and consultant in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who will be joining me here in a few minutes. For those of you who have not attended any of our webinars before, off to the side you'll find a chat box. And you can actually say who you are and where you're from if you'd like. It's always good to know who's here. And if you have any questions at any time, uh, feel free to type them in the chat box and Don and I will be happy to answer any questions at all that you have. Each month, Bakke Graduate University is going to be providing the BGU community, its friends, and those who are interested in the subjects that we're going to be talking about, uh, ideas that can help you to be a more effective transformational leader wherever God has called you to be. Bakke Graduate University is, of course, an uh, unaccredited university offering worldwide education at the intersection of theology, business, and ministry. Again, thank you for your time. You can introduce yourself over here in the chat box if you'd like to. Feel free to ask any questions. And in a moment, I'll be joined by Don Hilliard. I'm joined now by Don Hilliard. And Don, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate you taking the time to share with the Bakke Graduate University community. You and I have known each other for a long time. In fact, uh, you actually gave me my very first job out of graduate school. So we've known each other for I don't even know how long. A lot of years. Over, over 25 years. Yeah. But one of the things that I've learned from you and that I've really appreciated about our relationship is learning how to create effective relationships with those in the community. Would you take a moment and just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your experience and background? Well, I'm, I've been in the mental health community for over 35 years here in, in, in Tulsa area. Okay, I started the nation's first intensive outpatient program for children. Uh, and adolescence and expanded that into school-based services. Uh, we were for a long time a community nonprofit organization and so I had a board of directors that, that helped me operate my organization and uh, it, it's really key if you're going to be an effective organization to have a board that is proactive and, and that is not being drugged by you through the muck and mire of everyday work but is actually helping you get through the muck and mire of everyday work and, and, and making your job easier as, as a CEO, CFO. Sure, and this, this webinar really came out of a coffee we were having one day. We were sitting around and we were talking about the different needs that you know I have in some of my organizations that I consult with and the needs of the organizations that you consult with. And this is really a universal need that almost all of us have to really be able to motivate that board to be a driving force rather than a a drag on the organization. You do a lot of consulting now with other organizations, correct? That's correct. And uh, and and is this a, a large focus of your consulting work? I'm sure people don't call you up and say, you know, Don, I'd like you to fix my board or make my board more effective. Um, maybe some do, but they come to you with another problem, but in your assessment, you determine that this is probably one of the chief issues that they have to face? Yeah, it's, it's, it's frequent that you find that the chief executive officer uh, of the organization uh, is struggling with, with his or her board members, uh, not because they're terrible people. They're good people, they're caring people, they signed on for basically free labor, mm -hmm. okay, to be a board member in this organization when most of them are busy people in their own lives. Uh, but they just don't know how to effectively be board members and most CEOs, CFOs, don't know how to help them be the most effective board members they can be. So one of the things that you can bring to the table today, hopefully, are some actionable ideas. Uh, if we're the CEO or, or really any other executive position within an organization, uh, what are some actionable strategies for motivating that board? Are there some practical things that we can do? Well, the first thing that, that I would tell you that, that happens unfortunately, uh, is this whole almost parental notion that it's easier for me to do it than it is for me to teach you how to do it. And so most CEOs, CFOs, when they run into resistance with their board, okay, simply decide that their tack is to do the job 
rather than try to teach their board members to do the job because that's the easy way to go. But unfortunately, over time, it's not the easy way to go because then the CEO, CFO, job description keeps expanding and expanding and, and pretty soon they're burned out because they're doing their job and they're doing every board member's job at the same time. Sure. You know, I, I saw this years ago when we used to take kids on camping trips. Uh, my interns and practicum students were immediately instructed that the first thing we did when we get out there was to help the kids put up the tents. Not put up the tents, but help the kids put up the tents. If I turned my back for 15 minutes and came back to the situation, my staff were putting up the tents because it was easier for them to put up the tents than it was to teach the kids to put up the tents. You know, I, I actually am thinking back probably almost 30 years now and you telling me to let the kids set up the darn tents themselves. Right, exactly. So. Uh, and and, and that, that unfortunate reaction on our parts uh, is the same reaction that parents have when, you know, you send your baby child for the first time in to make their own bed and they make a bed that looks like an elephant's buried in the bed and so what do you do you go remake the bed right okay well you, you've taught the child nothing all right except that they failed right. all right which is not something you want to teach that child and and you have that same propensity with board members you know at Bucky graduate university one of the focuses of the educational curriculum whether it's the master's degree program um in either business or urban leadership or the doctoral program in transformational leadership or the ministry doctorate is the whole idea of transformational leadership and that's really what you're talking about here rather than either transactional or servant leadership transformational leadership being with somebody and being with and attending to that board probably the first step is picking the right board members to begin with I want to focus on some of the actual strategies that we were talking about the other day and really one of them is probably pick the right board members to begin with. Do you have some thoughts on how to select board members? Well, I think the first step in that process, Richard, is, is for you to decide what purpose within your board do you want board members to serve? And there are multiple purposes for board members, okay? Not all board members are going to be good at helping you raise funds. Some board members are going to be great at helping you attract an audience to your organization or agency. Some board members are going to be good at helping you attract attention to your organization and agency. And so the first thing you've got to do in, in deciding who you want to be on your board is what would you like them to help you accomplish? Sure. All right. Once you've decided that, then you look initially to your local community, okay, for people who are serving in those capacities. I mean, if I want publicity for my organization, then people who are in the media would be good people to have on my board because they can bring me attention. Attention. They can bring me ideas. They can bring me knowledge of media uh, and things that I don't particularly have but that I need. You know, one of the things that I run into a lot is organizations ask me, you know, uh, how do I get uh, press? How do I get visibility? And, uh, you know, I do run a company, Transformational Social Media, where I, I help people accomplish that. And you've helped me with some of those projects with other companies. But probably one of the easiest tactics is select a board member who's a member of the media. That's exactly correct. Or at correct. least a part of the organization. That's exactly correct. When, when I was looking, true story, and, and, and I'll try to make it brief. When I was looking to expand my board years and years and years ago, okay, one of the things we were doing at that time was we were doing a charity auction and we would raise funds. I would call people and ask them for donations. We would have an auction and auction off what we got. Well, one of the things I got was a dinner for two with the anchor of one of the major TV stations in the community. All right. Uh, I got a restaurant to donate the food. I got the TV station to donate his time to, do, to go to the dinner. Okay. When we went to the auction, I bought the dinner. Sure. Okay. Because I wanted to meet this man. And so I took my board president, and he and I took this person out to dinner. As a result of that, we introduced him to our agency. Uh -huh. Okay. It was the best money I ever spent out of my own pocket for anything. And he became a member of the board. He provided literally tens of thousands of dollars worth of free advertising. Sure. In, in segments he did on his news broadcast about my agency, 
uh, in coverage for other fundraisers we did, in sponsorship for other fundraisers we did. Uh, he, he literally probably was worth, over the years that he was at the station, a million dollars sure. to my organization. Now, not every board member we can ask to serve our organization is going to be a news anchor. No. So how do we take... Uh, board members who don't have a media background and really turn them into marketers and fundraisers because isn't that really one of the chief functions of the board members? Well, but again, you, you don't have to. Again, you're, you're looking at it the same way we did with the tents. What do I have to do uh -huh. to turn them into? Sure. You don't have to. What you have to do is develop that board synergy that allows those people who have expertise in this area to share their expertise with other people on the board so that synergistically they become much more as a whole than they are as individuals. Mm -hmm. So if my media person can begin to share some of their strategies and, and infuse those into other board members, other board members become more comfortable with using some of those strategies within their circle uh, to, to help my organization be more successful, to raise more funds, to raise more awareness, whatever the case may be. And it really is about synergy and, 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 and making a whole out of subjective parts. You know, I really think that's uh, important to see the board as a whole and functioning as a whole. You know, I think back to some of the team building exercises we've done with different kids and other groups of, uh, of either, even executives and sure. leaders in the community where we've had them do something for example, you know, walking and walking we do alone, but we do it together as a group to reach a goal. And boy, they have to learn how to do it. And you know, those sort of team building exercises that we might do in an executive leadership training or with a, a group of teens in a in a day treatment center really are ideally the the same type of approach that we want to be able to use with our board members, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think that one of the things that that is often overlooked with board members uh, is organizing board retreats mm -hmm. okay uh, and, and maybe it's not overlooked in the sense that organizations have them but they have them for awards and entertainment as opposed to training mm -hmm. of board members and I think if you would take the time with your board a couple of three times a year Okay, to take them off site someplace for a half a day, a day, doesn't have to be a whole day even, okay, and begin to do some of those team building exercises, okay, working with one another, brainstorming with each other, okay, where you break down the barriers that normally exist in board meetings because I'm at a board meeting and I'm doing my thing and everybody else is doing their thing and we've got a purpose and we've got an agenda. And the purpose of the agenda is to get something accomplished for the agency. Uh, and, and that's all well and good. And I'm not saying you don't have to have those. But somewhere you've got to have that time for those board members to connect. Absolutely. Okay. And become a whole. Mm -hmm. And doing those kinds of exercises in a board retreat, uh, having a little fun, laughing a little bit, being silly. Uh, I consult for a corporate training facility in, uh, in Dallas. And uh, we bring executives out there for uh, two or three day retreats on a regular basis. And it's just amazing to see how boards can really come together at, at an executive level or at a community level uh, to serve an organization with those type of trainings. Absolutely. Don, we've really talked about the first of our 11 actionable strategies. Before we go any further, I wanna pique everyone's interest and curiosity. What are the 11 strategies that we're gonna talk about in the time that we have here? Of course, the first one is pick, train, and create synergistic boards in the first place. Correct. The second one is to decide how much and how you're gonna pay your board. Uh, you know, uh, when you say that, a lot of people I'm sure say, wait, I thought board members served for free. Well, most board members are not paid cash money sure. for their positions, but anybody who gives you their time deserves to be compensated for that time. Now, how that compensation comes can be in the form of cash remuneration. It can be in the form of feeling good about themselves for contributing to the community and the organization. It can feel 
come to them because they've contributed to somebody in your organization who needed their help? You know, as a therapist, I really like the idea of meeting their ego needs as their payment. Now, number three on our list is to develop a, uh, a mission statement that really follows the answer to Drucker's five questions. Uh, Peter Drucker, management Correct. consultant, asked five questions. What are those five questions and why are they important, Don? Well, the five questions are you need to know what your mission is, who your customers are, okay, what your customers value, okay, what results you're looking for, and what your plan is for getting from point A to point B. Uh, and all too often that doesn't happen. The other thing that doesn't happen frequently enough is mission statements tend to be lofty and not practical. practical. And a mission statement has to be practical and actionable. It needs to really okay. be that elevator pitch for the organization. That's right. And it needs to be something that people can see your organization accomplishing. Sure. All right. In the foreseeable future, not 50 years down the road. Right. Not if all the pieces come into play exactly the way they need to come into play. So what you're saying is we can actually redefine our mission statement even periodically and update it for the current time. That's correct. Great. Now, let's come back to that here in a minute. You know, yesterday I was actually talking to somebody at Baki Graduate University in administration, and I said, every single person who works for Baki, every board member, everybody who's volunteering excessively for Baki needs to have a business card. Um, it seems like an old world strategy, especially in the era of electronic communication. Do you think that's important? Oh, I think it's absolutely important, okay. I think the physical act of handing somebody something. I, I know you can do all these things electronically. Sure. And, and and I'm not discounting the fact that you should be doing these things electronically as well. But the mere fact that you handed somebody something puts an image in their mind, okay. And a business card is without question the least expensive thing in the world you can hand somebody. All right. And if all it contains is your name and your organization's mission statement, you've made a great accomplishment. You've added another person to your repertoire of your organization. All right. And that's important. And if everybody who's associated with the organization is handing out those business cards, all right, then how many times is that mission statement being multiplied? Sure, absolutely. And I think that, you know, sometimes we look to a training to provide these lofty answers to answer these difficult questions. Sometimes it's the simplest solutions that really create the greatest level of transformation. Now, you and I were talking about a strategy that we've both used in the boards that we've worked with, and that's creating a special board position. What is that board position? The board position, you know, boards have presidents, they have treasurers, they have secretaries, they have sergeant-at-arms who, who are supposed to keep order, okay? What boards really also need to have is the Doubting Thomas position. Somebody needs to be assigned in every board meeting, and it can be a rotating person, it can be the same person, to question everything. Right. All right? Because all too often... We come up with an idea. We get all excited about the idea. Everybody else jumps on board, all right? And there's nobody questioning, well, what happens if this doesn't work? Well, what's the downside to this, all right? You know, and my daddy taught me something a long time ago, all right? You don't own a coin. There's not a coin in your pocket that doesn't have a face and a tail side. And every idea has a head sign <laughs> and a tail sign, sign too. And you need to have somebody in your organization, in your, in your board meetings, who's, hey, this yeah, is the tail of this. I really like that idea of, of having a rotating devil's advocate or doubting Thomas position where at today's meeting, you know, Don, uh, your job is to be the devil's advocate right. here, uh, to look at that tail side of things. And we'll come back to that in a minute uh, as well. One of the things that I think is a great strategy is giving your board members gold stars. Everybody likes a gold star. Do you remember when you were in first grade or kindergarten and you got oh, a gold absolutely. star? Absolutely. And there's absolutely no reason why we can't uh, give some rewards, whether it's a gold star or a $2 bill. No, you're absolutely correct. And, and, and there are lots of places where those things can be effective. You could, for instance, 
decide that next month the person on my board who gives out the most business cards gets a gold star or a two dollar bill or you can decide that we're all going to keep an eye on each other and we're going to come next month to the board meeting with an observation we've had about another board meeting doing something good for our organization and we'll reward that with a two dollar bill and uh, I actually have a pile of two dollar bills right here right. so uh, we could give those out to the board members and, and you know this is not the, the, have another the, the face bill value of this is two dollars all right the real value of this is the acknowledgement that I did something all right how many businesses have you walked into in your life that had in a frame somewhere by their cash register sure. the first dollar they ever took in all right you will find that as you begin to do this kind of thing board members will do the same thing you'll walk into their office a two dollar bill find framed. A two dollar bill framed okay <clears throat> give them a big gold star maybe they'll frame the big gold star too there you go this cost me a, a whopping 59 cents at the uh, so it's even cheaper than a two dollar bill uh, at the uh, uh, local Christian uh, book and school supply store. And, but uh, it's worth what value you assign to it. It's not worth 59 cents. It's worth the task that it was rewarded for accomplishing. Okay? The goal that was met. Uh, the acknowledgement that, that I've done something that my organization appreciates. All right. That's its intrinsic value. Yeah, the fact that it's a 59 cent gold star or a $2 bill uh, only makes it easier to be able to give them away because you're not investing a lot of money in gold plaques and watches and what have you. All right, so I can be a little freer with how I pass them out. Okay, but their intrinsic value is in what's been accomplished to achieve. You know, I, I guarantee if I give this to a board member at a board meeting, it's going to probably at least sit on their desk for the next week or two. Oh, absolutely. If they're up in a frame. Absolutely. And, and the other part of that is, I, I'm going to tell you this, if I'm that board member that got this and I set it on my desk at my office, wherever I happen to, to be in my business, everybody that walks into my office... I was gonna say, why I'm going to big... tell about this gold star. I got this from my board four. Right. All right. Again, what does that do? It Just... makes me feel good, which is what you want for your board member to feel. It also expands my influence as an organization. Somebody else has now learned about my organization. Yeah. I'm not any longer a covert board member, okay? I'm a board member who's busy telling people that I'm a board member. Right. And too often board members in organizations really do become secret agents. <laughs> okay. It's amazing. Sometimes board members, not only do they not tell anyone in the community about their work as a board member, because they're busy doing other things, not because they're trying to keep secrets, but then when we don't engage them, they stop coming to the board meetings and they really become sort of, you know, Agent 99 or, or whatever. Well, and, and part of the hang-up with bragging about being on a board, all right, is it feels like bragging and we're all told that that's not right. So I'm not going to toot my own horn by telling you how many boards I'm on and what things I'm doing for those boards unless I'm forced to put this gold star on my desk. The 59 cents a gold star. And guess what? I'm forced to share with you that I got this from my board for. Right. All right. Now, the, the eighth thing on our list deals with picking board members, but I separated it out from number one uh, because I think it's important to pick board members who are local. This is particularly true, I think, for international missions, uh, for international organizations, relief organizations, et cetera, who may see the need for board members uh, back in the Western world, you know, back in their home country, uh, people who have big names or deep pockets. Uh, but I think that often uh, these organizations are, are overlooking um, some of the most effective board members on a local level. Well, and again, it, it goes back to what we said at the very beginning, Richard. You've got to establish what purpose you want this board member to serve. If you want this board member to serve outreach to the international community 
yes, the local pastor at the church down the street is not going to be the person you want on in that position. But if I want acknowledgement of my existence within my community, that local pastor who sees a congregation of twelve or fifteen hundred, or one or two hundred, or, or one or two hundred, all right, is exactly the person I need on my board. Okay. And so you have to decide what purpose they're going to serve, and every board member can serve a purpose. Some locally, some internationally. All right. If I'm not an international organization, then I need nobody on my board with international recognition. It's not going to do me any good. Sure. Okay. Now, what about number nine on our list, which is um, a really transformation of the CEO? Uh, the CEO needs to uh, set a model for fundraising. And I think one of the most effective ways to do that is for the CEO to build relationships with the board members. You know, I'm, I'm teaching for Bakke uh, Graduate University a class right now in fundraising. And one of the questions that people often ask is, how do I retain donors? I think the number one factor in not retaining donors is failing to maintain a relationship with those donors. Is it? Well, the thing that, that I talk about when, when I talk to boards, all right, I almost never talk about fundraising. We talk in terms of friend raising, okay? If I can make you my friend, then the funds will follow. Sure. Okay. But it's important for me to make you my friend. That's my goal. We have to be friends. Okay, so you approach fundraising through friend raising. And, and the, the CEO models this in an organization by friend raising among board members. Exactly. So board members can friend raise among potential donors. Exactly. I mean, that's the model that I have to be friendly with all of my board. I have to have taken time out of my day to spend time in their day. All right, whether it's taking them out to lunch, having a cup of coffee in the morning, makes no difference, okay? Uh, we, we have to be connected socially at some level. Sure. As well as board member and CEO. If that's the only connection we have, that's the business connection, all right? That connection will wane. If we're connected at a social level, at a I'm comfortable with you, you're comfortable with me, we can go have a cup of coffee and yak, all right, or we can talk seriously about business, that relationship is far more likely to continue and exist. Well, and a perfect example of that, you know, I think you're a good example. I remember I was probably a 22 or 23 year old therapist. My first job uh, wasn't making any money, and you invited uh, my wife and I out to your boat for a day to, That's right. to, to barbecue some burgers uh, out on the lake, out on your boat, and uh, and, and that was, you know, uh, I think one of our first social connections. And just think over the last 25 plus years, how much business we've transacted in those. You know, uh, uh, coffee shop breaks or oh, absolutely uh, or, or other social uh, absolutely encounters. all right absolutely. Uh, I'm doing some consulting work for an agency here right now, and they want to become a provider for the state system uh, for mental health services. All right, I went to Oklahoma City yesterday and took a couple of ladies from the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority out to lunch. Mm -hmm. All right, you know. So that was your seven-hour lunch, two the and a half best hours. Best twenty-nine dollars I ever spent. Okay. Uh, whether I get reimbursed for it or the company says no, it's not. You're on the hook for it. It makes no difference to me. The best twenty-nine dollars I ever spent on behalf of this company. Sure. Because they now have two friends in the state office, who have already given me some new ideas on how they can generate revenue. All right. And that was over lunch. And, and all I did was, you know, I'd, I'd like to come down to the city and take you out to lunch. These are state workers. Who says no to that? Okay, right? And who takes state workers out to lunch? Yeah, right, exactly. There you go. Exactly. And, and okay. I've done that too. You know, I interact with a lot of the state boards, uh, the licensing boards, regulatory boards for mental health. 
and uh, you know people don't even know where their office is or where they exist. And I've taken the time to actually uh, stop by and say hello when I'm just driving through sure. Oklahoma City just to say hello. And occasionally I go out to lunch with them, and uh, and and th that's been a, a great way to really transform my relationship with those regulatory agencies. Now, number ten on our list is. Um, Schedule meetings or schedule a couple of board meetings each year where board members are encouraged to bring guests. Now, I had a question about that, Don. Isn't what happens in our board meetings supposed to be top secret? Well, why? I think a lot of people believe that board meetings are top secret and the idea of bringing guests is something that never occurred to them. They think a board meeting is boring. Who would want to come? Well, maybe if I'm the mafia. What happens in my board meeting is top secret. Mm -hmm. All right. But short of being a board member for the mafia, all right, there's nothing that happens in my board meetings that should be top secret. Everything should be public knowledge. Mm -hmm. I should be proud of everything we're talking about, every plan we have, everything we're thinking about doing, everything we've accomplished. All right. And, and I want to expose other people in the community to that. That's why I'm invi inviting my board members to bring a guest. Not necessarily a prospective new board member, although that could happen. Sure. All right. But simply a guest, somebody else to expose us to. All right. And yes, will there be some boring conversation that takes place that, that probably for a guest is... Not the wisest use of their time. Right. Yes. But they will also learn about an agency they knew nothing about beforehand. All right. And they'll learn about my involvement as a board member in that agency and maybe that turns itself into another board member maybe that turns itself into another active sponsor maybe that turns itself into a resource for some fundraiser I'm doing all right but it's somebody else in the community that now knows about my existence and that's what I want is everybody in the community that's my ultimate goal is for everybody in the community to know about my existence for it to acknowledge that I exist and that I'm doing valuable work in the community. Sure. You know, a lot of people ask me about social media, which I, I didn't add to our list. There's a lot more than just these 11 things. And sometimes the purpose of social media is just so the community knows we exist. It's not to give out a lofty idea. It's not to, you know, always uh, uh, point to something serious. It's simply so that people see our name and well, know and, that and, we and exist. Well, and to go back to that precept, Okay, when you talk about fundraisers, okay, and, and active things you do to raise funds, some fundraisers are done to raise money, capital, cash, valuable items, property. Some fundraisers are done to raise awareness, okay? If I can do a community fundraiser that gets me fifty or $60,000 worth of free media advertising, I just made fifty or sixty thousand dollars, and I haven't turned a buck yet. Right. All right. But I've got fifty or sixty thousand dollars worth of advertising and publicity, whether it be in print or whether it be on, on the radio, radio or, or whether TV. it be on TV, or uh, on Social the internet. Media, yeah. Okay. Uh, that I couldn't buy for love nor money, and that I don't need to spend fifty thousand dollars to purchase, because somebody's just given it to me. That makes my fundraiser all the more valuable, especially if I make money besides. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. You know. The money's just a bonus to the fundraiser. Right. Well, and some fundraisers need to make money because you need the money. Right. But some fundraisers need to make awareness because you need the awareness too. In order to raise money. Money. And accomplish the missions of the organization. Correct. Now, as King Solomon said, uh, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. What's the eleventh um, uh, actionable strategy that can turn our board from being an anchor into a propeller? Well, I think part of what has to happen is you need to take the time to educate your board. And if I were educating my board, I would educate my board with successful board members from other agencies. I would a couple of times a year at my board meetings bring a guest speaker in who is an active and successful board member in another organization or agency in my community and let them talk 
to my board members about how they're accomplishing their goals and objectives. All right, I think that's far more powerful than me telling you how to do, uh, how to be a board member, yeah. is to hear from another board member. What I really like about these 11 strategies is that they're all really based on that premise of transformational leadership. It's not top down. It's not about me doing it for them. It's about me using the strengths of the community Correct. where I work uh, uh, to serve the community where I work. Well, and it goes back to our original statement, okay? It's developing a synergy. If I invite the community to help me with my board, am I not developing a synergy? between the community and my agency. So if I want my board to develop a synergy, what's the best way to do that is to develop a synergy and let them see how it happens and let them feel the result of it. Once you feel the warmth of the sunshine, you want more sunshine. So we were having coffee this morning, Don, and you were talking a little bit about Peter Drucker's book. In fact, the book you have in your hand is Correct. one of your favorite books that you actually introduced to me years ago. It, it's a great book, okay, and, and it, it has so much value on so many different levels. The five most important questions you'll ever ask about your organization. All right. Now, Drucker addresses my organization as the entity. The entity and what I'm going to present or need to present to the community at large to make them want to be part of my entity. And okay. those five questions that he asks, you know, what's your mission statement? Who is your customer? Uh, what is your customer value? What are the results of the work that you do? And what's the plan of action? Right. But if you break it down even more simply than that, in my quest to attract board members who are going to be valuable to my organization. I want to answer those same five questions. I really do. I want to know what my mission is in spending time with you, why I think you're valuable as a customer, i.e. a board member, okay, uh, what you value that would make you want to be a board member, all right, what result am I trying to get and what's my plan for getting there? So you're really talking about taking Drucker's five questions and instead of applying them, and we're going to apply them to an organization or an entity as a whole, and we're going to print these five things on a piece of paper and we're going to make that available in our transparent board notes, etc. But you're talking about you're the CEO, you're going to recruit me as a board member, so you're going to apply these same questions to that Drucker asks of an organization to your encounter with me specifically? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Isn't that true? Isn't that what I want? I mean, in this particular case, my mission is to attract you to want to be a board member. Okay. Okay. So I have to identify you as a customer, which means I have to know what reasons I want you to be on my board. Then I have to know what you value that would attract you to being on my board. All right, and then I need to know what the result that I'm attempting is going to be and what my plan is for transmitting all that information back and forth, implanting that information in, in your head, okay, so that the end result is I get a person on my board who has a value to me and my organization and who values what they're doing for me and my organization by being on my board. You know, you've said something here that really is pretty transformational. I, I think that there are probably a few of the viewers who have, um, uh, who have viewed their board members as a customer, but for most people, that was an entirely new concept. You referring to your board members as customers of the organization. That in and of itself, I think, is transformational in an organizational culture. Well, I think if, if you look at, how do I say this? If you look at most interactions between people and organizations are people, okay, groups of people, all right, that there's that element of customer 
salesman marketer relationship that exists and everything you know for for 35 years all right uh, I have bucked heads with professionals in the mental health community who want to raise the level of what they do to some lofty end and, and we have some magical formula for changing people's behaviors and helping them to be more functional in the community and in the world all right and I've continued to say this and first of all I don't change anybody I've never changed anybody in my life I have difficulty keeping myself on track on a day-to-day -day <laughs> basis yet alone trying to change you any changes that happen within you happen because you choose to make the changes, not because I chose for you to make the changes or showed you the light. All right. You know, at Daybreak for years, we had a little poster that we used to give away to thousands of people. And I'm giving away thousands of them. I can still walk into places around this town. And probably see probably my office somewhere. Yeah, see them hanging up. And it, and it had a little guy walking down the street that got hit in the butt with a lightning bolt. And this phrase said, most people change not because they see the light, but because they feel the heat. Right. All right. Uh, and, and that is so true. But I've told people for years that, that what I do is I'm a salesman. I have the toughest sale in the entire world. I have to convince you to change your behavior. Right. And that's a tough sale because most people don't want to change how they do things or what their behavior is. Most people want to keep doing the same things in the same way. They just want different results. You know, and my guess is that most of the people who have participated in this webinar today are at one level or another feeling some pain or they probably wouldn't have paid attention for the full 50 minutes here. Um, these 11 things that we've talked about, you've worked with organizations in your consulting work to put them into action. Uh, what are the results that you see from this type of an approach, from the different things that we've talked about today? I think the most amazing thing you see is if you work with an organization, or are fortunate to work with an organization long enough to see what their board meetings look like at the beginning and what their board meetings look like at the end, mm -hmm. okay, you just have to walk into the room to know that there are different things happening. There's a lightness in the room when the board has made the transitions that we're talking about here. All right. There's a pleasantness in the room. There is a aura of collaboration and cooperation in the room that exists on its own. It lives and breathes and exists on its own. Okay. Uh, and when, and when you walk into that board meeting at the very beginning, and people are knee, 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 knee at each other, you know that this board's in trouble. This board is not accomplishing anything. These people are walking away from here feeling badly about themselves and badly about their time in the organization, and they're not likely to be here very long. All right. Uh, and that's the big difference. When you walk into that board meeting after the transformation has taken place, you got board members that don't ever want to go away. Now, you've seen this on more than one occasion oh yeah yeah so even if a board is really struggling there's really hope for any board by introducing some of these strategies isn't there oh yeah I, I just spent you know, up to about six months ago consulting with a, an agency in, in, in Texas that when we walked in was in total disarray uh, the agency was in disarray the board was in disarray their fundraising efforts were in disarray uh, they were losing money hand over fist in fact, they were thinking about giving up a couple of divisions of their agency because they were certain they couldn't make money at it. Okay. And interestingly enough, five years later, the two divisions that they wanted to flush are the most successful, are the most successful and making the agency over 60% of their total revenue. Sure. Okay. You know. Now, Don, you've really given us a lot to think about today. Um, I want to thank you for your time. I hope that uh, over the next couple of months as we continue to offer uh, training to leaders at, at Bakke Graduate University that 
we can maybe count on you for some more of your time. If people have any questions and they'd like to get a hold of you, uh, how can they? What, what's your website? My website is www.resolutionfinders, all one word, dot org. Okay, so www.resolutionfinders.org. They can send you an email. They could check out that website and That's find out correct. more about you. Awesome. Don, again, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. I want to thank everybody for participating and for the time that you've given to listening to some of the ideas that we've presented today. At Bakke Graduate University, one of our plans over the next few months is to begin offering on a monthly basis webinars that can provide support to leaders in ministry, leaders in community development, and leaders in for-profit businesses. This is, of course, what Bakke Graduate University does through its Masters of Business Administration, Master of Arts in Global Urban Leadership, Master of Arts in Civic and Social Entrepreneurship, Doctor of Ministry, and Doctor of Transformational Leadership programs do. If you're interested in further information about either the certification programs offered by Bakke Graduate University or the degree programs offered by Bakke Graduate University, please contact our admissions office anytime you have any questions at www.bgu. Edu. I want to give a shout out again and a thank you to Don Hillier from Tulsa, Oklahoma for participating today and donating his time to our community. Over the next couple of months, I'm going to be scheduling several other webinars with other leaders in the area of uh, transformational leadership. I'm going to spend some time with Dr. Kit Danley from Neighborhood Ministries in Phoenix, Arizona and spend time with her talking about Christian community development. I'm going to be spending time with University President Dr. Brad Smith talking about transformational leadership. I'm also going to be spending some time with some of the leaders in the Seattle area and hopefully some of our international leaders as well on a variety of different subjects that can be useful to you, the communities that you serve, and the people who you minister with. If you've never attended any of our webinars before, again, I'm glad that you've participated in this today. Please tell a friend that they didn't miss the event. They can access the full video archive at any time after the event. Look for our next webinar next month, and please sign up in advance so we have an idea of who will be there and how many we need to make technological space for. And again, if you have any questions about uh, this presentation, you can always contact Don Hillier. Uh, he's more than happy to answer any questions. You can contact me at any time, richardn at bgu.edu. And please feel free to contact the office at Bakke Graduate University with any questions about the services they provide. www.bgu.edu, accredited worldwide Christian higher education.